Um, any, depth, any debt of gratitude is owned, owed to Ralph, I have to say, not, not to me. He is um, a great supporter of, of science. Um, you, you've heard already of his foundation. You've heard of the support for the Science and Society um, initiative at the Royal Society, which was a really um, bold um, move on his part, and um, support for um, science in general in the United Kingdom. We are grateful to you, and I'm personally grateful um, to be um, here um, giving the first Cone lecture. So, I wasn't quite sure what to do today, and I decided um, to do a sort of hybrid, um, a hybrid talk. I'm going to spend the first third, or maybe a little more than a third, um, really going back over a quarter of a century and describing fairly uh, briefly um, the work that led, or the work from my laboratory that contributed to um, understanding that cyclin-dependent kinases are the engine of um, eukaryotic cell cycle control. So that part will be historical. Um, there's two reasons I decided to do that. One is I thought it, 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 it might be interesting. I hope it will be. And secondly, as I anticipated there would be um, uh, quite a lot of uh, younger researchers in the audience, I thought if you could see um, what rotten experiments we used to have to do um, 20, 25 years ago, and um, you could compare with what beautiful experiments you can do today, um, it would encourage you somewhat in, in what you do. So that was a, the second reason for doing that. Then I'll spend the uh, second part of the talk talking about two projects that are current in my laboratory, which build on the earlier work, so um, it's, it's not divorced from that. One which was um, published last year, and the second that's not published. So it'll be a mixture of history and also um, current work. Now, my obsession, um, actually all my working life, has been the cell cycle. My family think I'm a very sad person to have such obsessions, but it is um, absolutely true. The cell cycle is, um, of course, the... Um, the period between the birth of a cell and its subsequent division into two. And I was particularly interested in the control of this process because it's the basis of the growth and reproduction of all living organisms. And um, that puts it in a, as a very crucial um, control in um, the, the development of all, um, of all life. How it's controlled is important not only as a basic biological problem, and I have to say that's the reason I was initially attracted to it, but um, also because it does have um, uh, importance for um, clinical problems, particularly cancer, where um, cell division goes out of control. Now, this has become quite a well-researched topic. It was not always like that, I have to say, but it's become quite a well-researched um, topic, such that if you pick up a review of the cell cycle and its control, and you work your way through the 50, 60, 80 pages that might be there, around halfway through, you will begin to get rather depressed, because they will put together a summary figure of the um, uh, genes and proteins involved in that control, and it will look something like the London Underground map, with um, lots of, uh, of station names um, connected by arrows that are uh, apparently meant to explain the process. I always find this, in fact, quite depressing because you only feel that you'll never um, understand the process looking at this. So I begin uh, my talks with an optimistic slide, um, which is to reduce it to the bare essentials, and you see it up there. What we have is the statement of the problem that I'm going to address. Common to all eukaryotic cell cycles are two events. S phase, when chromosomes replicate, and M phase, or mitosis in the mitotic cell cycle, when those replicated chromosomes segregate into the two newly divided cells. We have then two gaps, um, G1 gap before S phase and G2 gap between S phase and M phase. And there's one of each of these events that occur each cell cycle. And my interests are focused on what controls the onset of S phase, the G1 to S transition? What controls the onset of mitosis, the G2 to M transition? And how are these are linked together to produce the sequence that we see makes up the eukaryotic cell cycle? 
So that's our problem, and it's written there in a simplified way to encourage us that the problem can be solved. And um, I hope I'll show at least we have partial answers. The organism that I um, have used um, for nearly everything I'm going to tell you, not quite, but nearly everything, has, um, has been the fission yeast Schizosaccharomyces pombi. This is a yeast, um, a simple single-cell eukaryote. It's a fairly useless yeast in the sense it doesn't do useful things like make bear, beer or bread or wine. Um, it makes a rather disgusting beer called pombi in East Africa, um, a banana-based fermentation, which everybody says is terrible to drink, and that accounts for its name pombi. But it is quite good as a cell biological model organism, and it has excellent uh, genetics and now excellent um, genomics. It has around um, 5,000 genes. My lab led a consortium that sequenced it. Um, we published that. Um, it was the fourth eukaryote, I think, to be sequenced. Um, we published that about uh, nine or ten years ago. It took us... I think it was five or six years to finish this sequence, and I think you can now do it in about 15 minutes, uh, something of that sort. So that's my first lesson, you know, things do improve. More recently, um, and in fact we got our paper accepted today, I'm pleased to say, what a struggle it was as well, you know, those rotten reviewers out there, but we got it accepted today. Um, where we have constructed a strain collection where every gene has been deleted, all 5,000 genes. So we have 5,000 strains with each gene deleted, which allows us to um, produce um, lists of genes involved in different processes. And that's going to be Im important for, um, for future work. This was done for budding yeast some years ago, but we've eliminated 99% of all fission yeast genes in this strain um, collection. So it's a very good... Um, a very good model system. Well, um, I started working on this in the early 1970s and started by isolating um, mutants that were defective in this process of going around the cell cycle, as I showed you on the previous slide. And these were called uh, CDC mutants, or cell division cycle mutants, which at high temperature could not complete one of these um, events. And this was really work that was, at the time, simply repeating what Lee Hartwell, um, who eventually um, also got uh, the Nobel Prize for this work, um, were, had done in the budding yeast. And I'll show you here um, the uh, first paper that was published, and I worked there with um, um, two individuals, um, Kim Naismith, who was a graduate student who I supervised um, for most of his time. He was the student of Murdoch Mitchison, and Pierre Thurio, and I'll show you a picture of him later. This is Kim at the time when he was working with me. And what we did is isolate temperature-sensitive um, uh, cell cycle mutants, which could, um, could not divide at the high temperature, because they were blocked in S phase, G1, G2, or mitosis, but could continue to grow. So they didn't have a trivial problem with making RNA protein or anything of that sort. And you'll see that cells stopped um, dividing. This is a dividing cell. Um, they became highly elongated because they could continue to grow, or if they were blocked in cytokinesis, um, then they accumulated material that was um, destined um, for the um, septum. And this analysis identified around 30 CDC genes that were required for cell cycle progression. We now know, because we've screened those 5,000 deletions that I just, uh, said we'd made, uh, uh, we, we just got published today, we now know there are around 350 um, genes required for cell cycle progression in, 50, in fission yeast. So we identified at this time point about 10% of the total genes that were necessary. Now that was a start, but I, as I said in my introduction, what I was really interested in is what controls cell cycle progression. What these sorts of uh, mutations identify are genes that are necessary for uh, completion of the cell cycle, but do not necessarily have a controlling ro role. Now, controls mean different things to different people, and the um, definition um, that I was attracted to, largely uh, thinking about the control of metabolism, was identifying major rate-limiting steps for cell cycle progression, where the cell was controlling um, the overall rate of the process. So I was interested in seeing whether such rate-limiting steps existed in the cell cycle, and if they did, what genes were involved in them. 
And to do that, a different sort of mutant was required, and that mutant is shown here, and you'll see um, wild-type cells in panel A, and you'll see this mutant in panel B, which were simply cells dividing at a small size. Um, these were mutants that would advance you prematurely in, uh, through the cell cycle, so you divided um, before you had time to grow to the normal size. Very simple um, phenotype, very simple sort of logic. And this I, uh, established that there were indeed rate-limiting steps controlling cell cycle progression, and you could identify genes that were involved in them. These genes, mutants, I called we mutants, W-E-E, -E, because they were small, and I isolated them in Edinburgh, and it seemed a funny name at the time. I have to say, if you are tempted to name a gene or a protein with a witty name, do remember, it may be witty the day you name it, but will it be witty the next year or the next decade, or in this case, the next millennium? And on the whole, the answer is no, so do be careful about it. Now, um, this particular um, uh, uh, gene, which I'd like to say I got these mutants by thinking hard about the problem and then saying this is what I should look for, but the reality was I wasn't looking for them at all. Um, I uh, simply spotted something under the microscope that looked like this, and then it made me think about what, what it might mean. So it was entirely serendipitous, as much of my research seems to have been. But the first mutation that was isolated was, in fact, temperature-sensitive, looking like this at low temperature and like this at high temperature. I discussed it a lot with uh, my colleague at the time, Peter Fantes, postdoc with Murdoch Mitchison, in Edinburgh, in whose lab I was working. And I want to say something about Murdoch. I worked with Murdoch for seven years in Edinburgh. I published about 15 papers during that time with him. He did not put his name on any paper that I produced because he was of the school that unless he contributed with his own hands something to the work, he should not be a co-author. I mean, very, very generous, and I want to acknowledge him. I'm going to see him on Saturday, actually. Um, and um, also... It's, of course, a past tradition. We don't do that so much now, but he was a, a great, a, a great um, boss um, for me at that time. Now, this initial mutation was temperature sensitive, and that allowed us to determine um, w the timing in the cell cycle of the event which was, uh, which was rate limiting. Because if you shifted up cells that looked like this to the high temperature, you could ask how long did it take before cells start dividing at a small size. If this rate limiting step was towards the end of the cycle, they would start dividing at a smaller size rather quickly. If it was towards the beginning of the cycle, they would take a whole um, generation before they did that. And you can see here, this is a two and a half hour generation time shifted at time zero and this is the paper in the mid-1970s, and this is cell size at division that begins to change about 40 minutes after shift, and you, you hope you can see here, there was a pulse of cells going into mitosis and cell division. This allowed us to say that the rate-limiting step occurred about 40 minutes before cell division, which was actually at the uh, transition between G2 and mitosis. And so this very simple analysis identified, firstly, there was indeed a major rate-limiting step for the cell cycle. Secondly, there was at least one gene involved in the process, W1. Thirdly, it was acting in G2 and determined the timing of mitosis. Just that very simple set of experiments. Now, um, the question was, um, were there other um, such um, um, we, uh, we mutants? So um, I proceeded to... Um, uh, having nature having give, given this to us, I proceeded then to visually look for more mutants. And I set myself the target of um, identifying f uh, 50 such mutants to identify how many genes there were. And every time I isolated a mutant, I checked whether it was a new allele of we one I got to, I think, about the 47th or 48th mutant, and they had, were all alleles of we one Everyone had been alleles of we one and I suppose I thought everything after that was going to be an allele of we one and I was getting rather bored with it. So when I got the 48th or 49th, and the plate was covered with fungus, which does happen, and those who have done microbiological research will know what I'm talking about, I decided, because it was a wet Friday afternoon in Edinburgh, to throw it away, and um, because it was bound to be a, a mutation in the we one gene, I went home and had my tea began to feel guilty about it, 
And because it was a university in the 1970s, I knew that the rubbish bins wouldn't be emptied um, for a, a while. And so I cycled back and picked the um, plate out of the, um, of, of the rubbish. And of course, that was the only Wii mutant that was not an alley of Wii 1. It was in an unlinked gene. And furthermore, um, it was um, a mutation um, that was dominant, whereas the Wii 1 mutants were recessive or semi-recessive. So the fact that it was a dominant mutation in a second gene and was rare made me think that actually, um, whilst um, we one was likely to be an inhibitor, and I did some classical genetics involving nonsense suppression, which I haven't time to tell you about, to show that we one was indeed a, 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 an inhibitor at the G2M transition, that we two, as I called it, you can see how these names get rather silly, we two, as we called it, um, could have been a positively acting gene, and that um, the a mutation that produced a hyperactive gene was giving a rise to mitosis uh, prematurely. So cross this uh, mutation to all the 30 CDC genes which we identified, and we too turned out to be very closely linked um, to a gene called CDC2, which had been previously identified as a temperature-sensitive mutant. I identified it in this earlier study, um, in uh, acting, um, we thought, solely at the G2 to M transition. So this suggested that CDC2 could be mutated in two ways. Um, to a, 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 a dominant advancement phenotype or a recessive delay phenotype. But I was worried, because I was a bit of an anal obsessive and still am, I was worried that maybe we 2 was just adjacent to CDC2 and they weren't the same um, gene. So decided to collect a load of CDC2 alleles and then construct Benza style a fine structured genetic map by classical genetics of this region. Um, this, incidentally, took about two years to do. It wasn't an easy sort of project to do. And once um, I, um, I, I had done that, it turned out that the Wii mutant allele mapped within the CDC2 mutant alleles, and indeed one CDC2 mutant allele with both Wii at low temperature and CDC at high temperature. So that argued that the CDC2 gene was a positively acting control acting at the G2M transition, and we one was acting as a, a, a negative element in that control. And here I was helped by Pierre Thurio, who's shown here. Um, you can see the sort of drug fumes coming off the top of his <laughs> head here. And this is me, would you believe, at the time. And um, you'll see I had both hair and it had color at that, um, at that time. So this paper, which overall, because uh, there were other things that we did, we did with it, uh, at the time, took about three years, established that there, there were these two genes involved in this rate-limiting control. Now, I have to tell you, I quite liked this, these papers. The real problem was nobody else was terribly interested at the time, which is, you know, <laughs> not that unusual, I have to say, in science. And I was looking for a job, and um, uh, the reason people weren't terribly interested was because we were focusing on control. I, I was talking about control acting at the G2 to M transition, and most people who had thought about the cell cycle thought that all the controls in the cell cycle happened at the G1 to S transition, progression through G1. And so, since I was looking for a job, I thought I'd better do something at the G1 point, just to sort of make myself more attractive. And um, I decided to um, repeat another set of experiments carried out by Lee Hartwell, um, which was to look for a control that he had called START. And um, this was a point in the cell cycle where the cells become committed to the mitotic cell cycle. So the argument was that you challenge cells at different stages through the cell cycle, and you challenge them to do something else, an alternative developmental um, possibility, and in this case it was conjugation. And um, the argument um, that Lee used was that once you were past the point of commitment to the mitotic cycle, you would not be able to do this alternative developmental pathway. It's a, a, a really a, a developmental genetic type of, um, of argument. And he showed there was a point in late G1, called, which he called start, where you became committed. I had the same collection in fission yeast of CDC mutants. I thought I could repeat this, and you know it wouldn't take too long, get a paper at G1 and control, maybe somebody would be interested in hiring me. Anyway, um, 
I did the experiment, and it worked quite well. I showed that a transcription factor, well, we, ne we didn't know it then, CDC10 blocked at start, and everything else later in the cycle couldn't conjugate, so um, it seemed that the same thing was happening in fission yeast. And then at the very end of these series of experiments, I, I made a mistake. I decided to do the control experiment, which, as you all know, is always a big error in any experimental investigation. And in the control experiment, I decided to use the CDC2 mutants, which I'd done most study of, and I knew for certain blocked at the G2 to M transition, because that shouldn't be able to conjugate, okay, because the cell was completely committed. So I did the experiment, and instead of getting a low level of conjugation, you know, three... 0%, 1%, 2%, something of that sort, I got an answer of 20 to 25%, okay? Now, being a biologist, I'm not very quantitative, so I was um, trying to do my best to sort of turn 25% into 0%, and um, it, it didn't work terribly well, and so I did the next thing that biologists do when faced with that problem, which is to check the temperature of your water bars in an obsessive sort of way, which, of course, I did also, and, and having gone through those sort of steps, ended up um, getting 20 to 25%. Um, I got a little depressed about it, put the data away, got it out again, did the experiment, got 20% again, and, um, and then um, didn't quite know what to do. Um, and then I... Um, well, then I had a dream, actually. And um, <laughs> in my dream, I had um, a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. And um, the, the devil said, you know, Paul, you've done all these experiments, um, you're working with your technician, Yvonne Bissett, um, you've only got one result that doesn't sort of fit. And do you know something? You're the only person in the world who knows that. <laughs> you could simply forget that result, not put it in the paper, and nobody would be any of the wiser. You'd get a job, you know, you could pay the mortgage, you know, you're... You could feed your children, and um, every, you know, everything will be fine. And then the angel said, you can't do that, Paul. You know, this is pursuit of truth. And in the pursuit of truth, you, you cannot possibly um, publish a paper like that. And I know it means that you'll not get a job, and you'll be thrown out of your house, and your children will starve. But that's just how it is. It is the pursuit of truth. And so um, I woke up in a cold sweat, and then I felt... Maybe there's a third way, a third way, okay? And the third way was, what if the data was right, okay? Now, you have to believe me. Or you don't have to believe the angels and... Well, you can if you like, the angels and the devil. But the third way um, was, what if the data was correct? Do you know, it's really strange. When you do experiments like this and you get the wrong answer, you know, it takes you quite a long time to sort of imagine it's the right answer, you know? So I thought, is there any explanation for why you could get 20%? And the answer was, um, yes, it was a baroque explanation, but that maybe um, CBC2, as well as being required at G2 to M, which of course I knew, it was required at G1 to S at the start point. And because in fission yeast G1 is rather short, it's only about 20% of the cycle, if you shifted cells up to the restrictive temperature, you would block... 15-20% um, of the cells here, 80% of the cells here. This is what I'd mainly seen, because was, it was before fax, and that maybe it was this collection of cells here that were giving the 20%. Well, I tested it, I synchronized cells in G1, I got 100% conjugation, I measured DNA content, it was pre-fax, so I used diphenylamine, for any of you ancient enough to remember diphenylamine, and um, I can see Ron Lasky up there, so maybe... He does. Anyway, so the DNA content did not increase, and that showed that CDC2 was required at two points in the cell cycle, at G1S at the start control and at G2M where it was the major rate-limiting step in the pathway. And that was unexpected because S phase and mitosis are so utterly different processes. You would not have thought that a single gene could have been required in controlling both those steps. Well, then my uh, lab decided to go into um, investigating this um, in, in, more, in much more detail. I committed my la whole lab to looking at CDC2, developed molecular genetic techniques for fission yeast, because this was now, up until this point, all BC, before cloning, and after this was, um, was um, after cloning, and cloned the gene, um, sequenced it, 
And that, at the time, it had to be, it was specialist labs who did sequencing. This is something else, I mean, it was, it, it turned out to be a 2 KB Hindi 3 fragment. And I contacted Fred Sanger and asked if he would be interested. And he said, no, but I got a postdoc who would. The postdoc said, I'll do that for you. It'll take me about one year. Um, you know, we can now do it in about a millisecond, but I mean, um, it took him a year, and um, during which time I did various other things. And when we got the sequence back, um, then uh, you put it into the database, and uh, you know, the database was just full of molecules like sort of cytochrome C, um, because that was, you know, what the protein um, chemists had produced. So, in fact, the only thing that it hit was um, PP60 SARC, which was thought to be a protein kinase. So we guessed it might be a protein kinase. So then I, were, I got a series of great postdocs. This one was Sergio Moreno, which is yet another appalling picture of me of the time here. Um, and um, I mean, you can see why I couldn't get a job, couldn't you? I mean, <laughs> I, mean I wouldn't give a job to anybody who looked like that either. I mean, but anyway. Um, so we expressed, um, you know, we, uh, this is all commonplace, it wasn't quite so commonplace then, expressed CDC2 in bacteria, made protein, uh, made antibodies, um, immune precipitated, immune precipitated um, CDC2, or what we thought was CDC2, and then looked for kinase activity, found an activity against casein, but me being a geneticist was really nervous about all this sort of antibody stuff, and so um, was worried that it was just some contaminating kinase there and did an experiment that I borrowed from the, um, from the um, phage geneticist, really, the viral geneticist, and that was to um, grow up wild-type and various CDC2 mutant cells at permissive temperature. These are all TS CDC2 mutants. Um, and then make extracts, assay for kinase activity in wild-type at 25 in vitro and 37, and show that at least in one allele, the activity we were measuring was temperature sensitive in vitro, temperature sensitive in vitro, just moving the, um, uh, the in vitro extract. And the only difference between wild type and this strain was the TS mutant in CDC2. So that showed you that the activity we were measuring here was associated with CDC2, and therefore it was a protein kinase. And, um, and Circio, that was done with Viestas simanis, and Circio shown here showed that that kinase activity underwent a peak of activity at the end of G2, just before the onset of mitosis. So we now had a molecular mechanism, which was that the CDC2 was a protein kinase, rate limiting for cell cycle progression, and determined the timing of the onset of, um, of mitosis. How was it regulated? Well, that um, I um, could do because we um, had, over the years, characterized a number of interacting genes in particular, two, we one and CDC25, which um, Paul Russell, who came from Ben Hall's lab, cloned in the mid-1980s, and by sequence comparison concluded we one was a protein kinase, and we postulated that CDC25 was a phosphatase. There were no phosphatases in the databases at that point. And we drew this little picture that you see here of a simple controlling network, whereby we one was, um, we postulated was phosphorylating CDC2 to keep it inhibited, and that was removed by CDC25. And then Kathy Gould came to my lab, that's Kathy Gould here, and um, from Tony Hunter, and uh, did uh, uh, analyze what uh, phosphate groups were present in the CDC2 protein, identified a phosphatyrosine, it was the first phosphatyrosine in the mi microbe, and showed that uh, the we one protein kinase was responsible for phosphor phosphorylating that tyrosine, and furthermore, it became dephosphorylated as cells underwent mitosis. So we now had a simple biochemical um, uh, mechanism of um, protein phosphorylation controlling the activation of the um, kinase. Now, this was all very well, but the question was, was it relevant to, you know, real eukaryotes, um, you know, um, mammalian cells, or, or our cells, and um, that was a project looked at by Melanie Lee. When she came to my lab, she asked if she could do a difficult project. Okay. So I said, sure, you know, clone human CDC2 and make yourself famous, I said. And um, so she tried to do that for a year by traditional methods, which were um, reduced stringency, uh, hybridization, 
um, this is before PCR, by the way, and also using expression lambda GT11 and so on. Again, some of you may remember these, um, these vectors. Um, and we got protein kinases, but we knew there were hundreds of protein kinases. And so in the end, we did a complementation approach, a rescue approach, whereby we took a cDNA library, which I got from Paul Berg, transformed it into a fission yeast CDC2 mutant, which was defective for the CDC2 gene, the cells died, and arguing that if it took up a gene from the cDNA library, the human cDNA library, which was functionally equivalent to the fission yeast CDC2, not simply structurally similar, but functionally equivalent, then that could um, rescue the defect. The cells would grow, form a colony on the plate, we could isolate the plasmid back and see if it was the human homologue. And that approach did work. I'm not sure it deserved to work, but it did work. And we um, cloned the, um, the, the, the gene that way, sequenced it. And do you know, it was 61% identical at the amino acid level. Over a billion years divergence, 61% identity. Just, ama just really, truly um, amazing. Well, that led um, to... Um, uh, um, a proposal that this was a universal control mechanism regulating the onset of mitosis involving um, CDC2 um, as a cyclin-dependent kinase. Um, uh, 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 Tim Hunt had discovered cyclins, um, a completely different story, um, which I haven't time to tell you here, and then the cyclin-dependent kinase regulated by phosphorylation, activated at mitosis, brings about mitosis, destroyed at the exit of mitosis, and um, that was the basic, um, basic mechanism. Others, others showed in Metazoa, not my lab, that there were other cyclin-dependent kinases that acted at the, um, at the G1S transition, and this gradually led to the paradigm, which I'm going to actually discuss in the second part of my talk, where we're almost at, that there were different cyclin-dependent kinase and cycling complexes that bring about the G1 to S transition, the G2 to M transition, and other transitions in the cell cycle. And a third transition, which um, in fission yeast, um, we identified uh, by looking for mutants that could reinitiate S phase from G2, which identified a, a, a new role for the cycling dependent kinase that was um, characterized by Jackie Hales in my lab. What she showed is that the CDC2 uh, cyclin-dependent kinase in G2 played a positive role in G2 to promote mitosis, which is the legitimate event for a G2 cell, and in turn inhibited um, a further round of S phase, which is the illegitimate event for a G2 cell. And that very simple um, model explains why there's only um, um, one uh, 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 S phase of mitosis in each cell cycle, because a G2 cell um, cannot reinitiate S phase because of the presence of this CDK. And she speculated that if we get rid of this CDK here, uh, you'd lose the inhibitory signal, and the cells would get locked into an endo-reduplicating cycle, which is exactly what happened. And you'll see these enormous cells stained for DAPI with these gigantic nuclei, um, which are up to 64 or even 128C in um, four or five generations. There's the fax profiles to show that. This is actually drama for a fission yeast biologist. This is about as exciting as it ever gets for us, poor souls that we are. This is, um, this is a wild-type stained cell. This is, uh, this is um, this mutant re-replicate, I mean, it is amazing, isn't it? Just look at those things. I mean, and that, happens in, that happened in about, um, how many hours? 16 hours, you go from this to this. I mean, I'm just blown, blown away, but, you know, I told you I was sad anyway. But, uh. <laughs> so that's the other role for CDKs, which will introduce me to the next section of my talk. So now we have three roles for CDKs, G1S, G2M, and a block on S phase. And this is the paradigm that, um, y that I think that people are generally taught. This is a textbook on the cell cycle, very good one um, by David Morgan. And um, in the second part of my talk, so history's done, okay? We're now current. This, isn't, this is work done in the last year or two. And I want to challenge the paradigm which, uh, that you see here. Um, and the, the paradigm is that you get different CDK complexes. They catalyze the G1S transition and the G2M transition. They block reinitiation of S phase. And I want to argue that this can, all of these steps can be catalyzed by a single cyclin-dependent kinase. One cyclin and one 
kinase subunit. And everything can be done by a single CDK complex. And what matters is not qualitatively different kinase activities that bring about these differing events, but simply the amount of activity that's present in the cell. So that's the, the next uh, project I want to tell you about. Now, I need to introduce you to um, some of the genes I need to talk about. CDC2 I've told you about um, here. It complexes with CDC13, which is the major G2M cyclin, um, and responsible for the onset of mitosis, and with SIG1, SIG2, and PUC1, all of which act at the G1S boundary, but the major one is SIG2. So if you delete SIG2, you um, normally delay onset of S phase, and if you delete all three, S phase is very slow indeed. So that's, that's the, the basic data. Now, we had an inkling in the 1990s that there was something wrong with this um, idea. And this was a paper from a graduate student of mine, Dan Fisher. And what he'd looked at, and it was not his central part of his project, was a strain shown here. Temperature sensitive for CDC13, that's the G2M cyclin, and deleted for SIG1 and SIG2, the two major G1S cyclins. And what he showed was that when this strain was grown, it synchronized in G1, grown at the low temperature, the cells fairly rapidly went into S phase when CDC13 was active. If, however, he did it at high temperature when CDC13 was inactive, these cells did not go into S phase. Now, that was a funny result at the time because it suggested that the major G2M cyclin was substituting for the G1S cyclin. And given that this was the only major CDK complex left, we were forced to suggest, but nobody liked it very much, that it was this complex that was catalyzing both G1S and G2M. And we didn't pursue it, because nobody in my lab was very interested, until um, Mar Mariana Barbacid, working in Madrid, showed that in mammalian cells, it was a different sort of experiment, that uh, fibroblasts at least, that CDK1, which is the equivalent of CDC2, um, was required at both G1S and G2M. And up until that point, it was thought that a different CDK, CDK2, was required at G1S. So we decided, and by we I mean Damien Cadrusa, who was a postdoc from France in my lab, to re-examine this, to really try and nail whether a single CDK um, complex can do the job. And the approach we're going to use, it's not synthetic biology, um, but it is sort of inspired by the synthetic biology approach, which is to simplify the control circuits involved um, to an extent where we might reveal the basic, um, the more, the crucial aspects, the core principles of the control. And that's what I'm going to tell you about um, in this part of the talk. And the approach that he did is shown here. The first thing he did was to fuse CDC13 to CDC2 with a linker there, put it under the CDC13 promoter and, and, and UTR. So we had a chimeric protein of cycling and CDK um, uh, um, it present in the cells. So that we, this means that this complex would be a zero order reaction. It would be the preferred reaction. You're not having a cycling and the CDK trying to find each other and then being stabilized. So two, it's a single protein, okay? And um, he, he made this strain, it clearly uh, worked, and then he did something that I didn't think would work at all. He proceeded to march his way through the genome and delete every gene that I just spent the la last 20 years of my life showing was important, okay? And proceeded to show that it wasn't important, okay? So he deletes, of course, CDC2, he deletes CDC13, he deletes SIG1, he deletes SIG2, and he deletes PUC1. So that's every mitotic cell cycle cycling that we, we know about. He also deleted CDC25 and WE1, which is two other genes, and RUM1, which encodes a CDK inhibitor, and the cell doesn't care at all. This chimeric protein can do everything without it. But um, I need to show you the data so you believe me. Here's an experiment where we've, um, we've got rid of all the cyclins in CDC2. The generation time is identical. The cell cycle is similar. The only difference is the cells are a little longer at division, so there's a certain delay at division. So it looks very good. Is it regulated normally? Well, it's certainly destroyed. It accumulates this chimeric protein as you go through the cycle. Here we've tagged it with YFP. You'll see that as the cells go through the cycle, they, they're, they're ordered here according to length. 
what you can see is that the protein begins to accumulate. It accumulates in the nucleus. The cell goes into mitosis. Those two nuclei divide. And then the um, chimeric protein is destroyed at the same time as cyclin is destroyed in a normal cycle. And then you have no protein left at the end of the cycle here, or very little protein. So it's regulated in much the same way. It's also, um, uh, and this is just a little bit more for the aficionados, um, if we look at the cells down here, you'll see this is wild type, this is the fusion protein. If we now eliminate that tyrosine phosphorylation control that I uh, was telling you about, the, uh, the we one cdc 25 control, which phosphorylates tyrosine 15 in the protein, if we make a phenylalanine mutation there so it can't be phosphorylated, the cells are almost normal. It doesn't care about that. Wild type cells would be almost dead. They wouldn't be able to cope with this. So it can get rid of those controls. Um, this simply shows, but I won't tell you about it, that the checkpoint controls work perfectly normally here um, if you block DNA synthesis. Now, where are we then? What we can conclude up till now is apparently a single CDK complex can drive the main events of the cell cycle. Now, just to show that absolutely uh, uh, I that, that chimeric protein is required for that, um, Damien constructed a TS mutation in CDC13, which we'd identified, and um, introduced a Shokat mutation um, into the CDC2 protein kinase. Um, Shokat is an investigator on the West Coast who has enlarged the, uh, who, who enlarges the ATP binding pocket such that an, an inhibitor can get in there and block that protein kinase. I call it shockatizing the protein kinase, okay, as a sort of shorthand. And um, what um, you could then do is take this strain, shift to the high temperature to show that this component is necessary, or add the shockat inhibitor and show that that will block. And in both cases, um, you block G1S and G2M. And I'm just showing you that the cells get highly elongated here. So both components are necessary. Now, the reason we put in that shockat mutation was because it allows us to test whether absolute activity of the protein kinase is important. Because now what we can do is we can titrate in vivo into a culture different levels of the inhibitor, arguing that if you put more inhibitor in, you'll have less kinase, and if you put less inhibitor in, you'll have more kinase activity, and you're only targeting one protein kinase, this CDK chimera. And um, this, um, this uh, works. We constructed that strain. Um, it was an AS, uh, AS, so it had the shock at mutation, and we deleted um, all the cyclins and other, uh, the, uh, the native CDC2. Now, this is the model that we're going to test, okay? Um, I've, uh, and this I call the quantitative model. It's what we called it with Dan Fisher in the 1990s. Um, and here's the cell cycle. We have G1S, G2M. And it's color-coded. The, the redder you get, the more, the more activity you have. Okay, And so you have no activity at the beginning. You have low activity. That brings about S phase. You get more activity. That inhibits S phase. You get more activity, and you get mitosis. Right? Couldn't be a simpler model. It's really, really simple. Right? Lay, that, lay that out. And we don't quite know how the CDK rises during the cell cycle. Let me um, point this one over here. Um, and you can see that as the kinase increases, then first you'll get S phase, then you block S phase, and then you get mitosis. So you can, uh, you know, you can explain how everything um, uh, it occurs in a particular sequence. Now, this allows us to test this quantitative model, because what it would predict is that you will be able to inhibit G2 to M with a small amount of inhibitor, but to inhibit G1S, you need a lot of inhibitor, right? So that's the, that's the prediction. And you may be able to take a G2 cell and by playing with the levels of the inhibitor, either make it undergo S phase or mitosis. And I'm going to do those three sets of experiments. Okay? So the first experiment is to synchronize cells in G2, um, release them with differing amounts of inhibitor and see what happens to mitosis. This is a, a, an exper such an experiment that Damien did. Without any inhibitor, it goes into mitosis at about 45 minutes. If you add 75, you delay, 100, you delay, 250 or above, you completely inhibit the onset of mitosis. So we conclude 0.25 micromolar of inhibitor is sufficient to block onset of mitosis. Can you remember that? 0.25 micromolar. Right. 
Now let's see what happens with S phase. Here we synchronize now in G1, doesn't matter how we do that. We now add differing amounts of, of inhibitor to see if we can block S phase. S phase in this system undergo, is undergoes in 30 minutes. To see any delay of S phase, and in this case it's only around 50 minutes, you need 2.5 micromolar, okay? To get a more extended delay, 5 micromolar, and even 10 micromolar will only delay it for 2 to 3 hours. So 0.25 micromolar can knock out mitosis completely, and you need probably 20 times as much as that to block S phase. So that strongly supports that it's the level of the kinase that is crucially important. You only need a small amount of kinase for S phase. You need a lot of kinase to enter into mitosis. Now, what about a G2 cell? Because if this simple model is true, by playing with the uh, kinase levels, you can take, make a G2 cell either go into S phase or into mitosis, okay? Because that's what the, um, the model would predict. So we synchronize cells in G2 with a, low, a fairly low level of the inhibitor. And then if we take the inhibitor out, the cells will go into mitosis. That's, that's what you would, I mean, that's the straightforward result. The more interesting one is, if we add more inhibitor, would the cell go into S phase eventually? And uh, there's two experiments. This one was a preliminary, which showed if you add five micromolar, it does take an hour and a half, but eventually cells go into S phase from G2. Sort of almost counterintuitive. You take the inhibitor out, you go into mitosis. You add more inhibitor, you go into S phase. Okay? Now, we can do that experiment a little bit better by um, synchronizing cells in G2, incubating them with a lot of inhibitor, and then taking the inhibitor out and seeing if they go into S phase. That experiment's shown here. Um, in here, they've just been left with DMSO. They don't do anything. Here, they've been hit with a lot of inhibitor to knock CDK activity low. That activity has been taken out, and the cells undergo S phase. So now, going back to that model, which is this one here, um, what we see is that um, we only need low activity to go into S phase. So um, you need a, a lot of inhibitor to block it. You need a lot of activity to go into mitosis, so a small amount of inhibitor will block it. And if you're a G2 cell, if you let the activity raise, rise a bit, you'll go into mitosis. If you kill the activity, you'll knock it down from here to here, and then let the activity rise again, you'll go into S phase. So it's a very, very, the basic oscillator controlling, the basic control um, regulating the cell cycle can be in this simple system a single CDK, and it's the absolute level that matters. We're left with issues that, if we have time, we can talk about in the discussion as to how the same catalytic activity could bring about S phase and mitosis, and I'm happy to talk about that. That's project number one. Are we okay for another project, or are we getting a bit weary? Hmm? Look a bit more enthusiastic, and I'll... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do a second one. But I do understand if you start dozing off, okay? So, <laughs> take a big, deep breath, you know. Right. The second project is one that has interested me for uh, many, many years, and I've never had a, a decent um, idea about it um, until um, the last year or so. And this is um, concerning the inputs that regulate the cyclin-dependent kinases. Now, we know that nutrients influence this, and we've studied that on and off, and others have too. But more interestingly, it was for me, was cell size. Because um, the fission yeast cells um, undergo the G2 to M transition when they reach a certain cell size. How can a cell measure how big it is? Really interesting, very simple problem, but very interesting one. And you can see you, these are different mutants in the CDK network, which divide at these different sizes. And I'd never thought of a good experiment. And um, um, Jamie Mosley, who did this in collaboration with Anne Pagliotti at the Institute Curie, has made a significant contribution to this problem. But he did it initially by accident. Okay? He wasn't interested so much in cell size. He now is, of course, cell size measurement. But what he was interested in was the process of cytokinesis. And it's only by serendipity that we wandered into the fog and came out thinking about cell size. And I want to explain how that happened. Um, he was interested in identifying components required for cytokinesis. This is a fission yeast cell. It's got a mitotic spindle. 
And what had been noticed um, is that there is an accumulation of components that end up in the uh, ring, the cytokinetic ring, including actin, including um, myosin. And these proteins are, um, uh, accumulate in a cortical ring around the, um, around, around the nucleus. And he used a proteomic approach, doesn't really matter, using mass spec, to identify new components. One of them was um, a, a protein he called BELT1, BLT1. And you can see here that um, you get this cortical mid-band and then it tightens up into a ring which will eventually uh, contract. And this is myosin light chain that looks pretty similar. Um, having said that it looked pretty similar, what he began to notice is that BELT1 seemed to be appearing in the cell rather earlier than um, the myosin light chain. And this is shown more clearly here. This cell is very short. It's in very early G2. But you have a clear belt one, even though it's about an hour and a half before cytokinesis. So he began to ask, why should you have such a belt in a cell so long before cytokinesis? And um, the first thing he did is something which we should have done in the first place, which was a literature survey to see if anybody else had um, recorded um, any observations of this sort. And to our surprise, we found they had. And in fact, um, it was um, a paper from Cathy Gould. Now, I showed you Cathy Gould because she was a postdoc with me um, about 15 years ago. And she, about 10 years ago, published that there was a protein, CDR2, which was found in a belt around the middle of the cell and was there early in the cycle. Now, CDR2 was a, an upstream element to we one So we were gradually being sucked into CDK re um, regulation. So we got a bit interested in this um, by accident, as I said, through belt one, which is now irrelevant for this story. And so what, um, what he did was to tag CDR1, which is another component in here, and showed that it also is in a belt around the middle of the cell. So we began to wonder whether there was a reason why mitotic regulatory components were concentrated in the middle of the cell. Now, the element that's downstream to CDR1 and CDR2 is, of course, the we one protein kinase. And you would have thought, since, as you, if you were paying attention to the first part of my talk, that since we had identified we one in 1975, you would have thought we knew where we one was in the cell. But the truth was, we didn't know where it was in the cell. And the reason was is that when we cloned it and did the, tried to raise antibodies and, and tagged it, we couldn't see it. So we sort of moved on and then forgot about it. Okay? And, but things have, other things have moved on since then, including better microscopes and better, um, um, better uh, 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 tagging proteins as well. And so what it allowed us to do was to re-examine this. And this is the result we got, to our surprise. When we tagged we one and used a decent microscope, we found that we one was also not only in the nucleus, but also in these cortical ring uh, proteins around the, um, around the nucleus. So we now had a number of the components, including the major inhibitory element of the G2M transition, focused in the middle of the cell. And why that was attractive to us is because it, it gives rise to a very simple model. If there was a regulatory uh, function that controlled um, these proteins, and if this was located at the tips of the cell, okay, the ends of the cell, then as the cell got larger, those inhibitory components would be taken away from the middle of the cell. And once the cell had got big enough, you could activate the CDK and go into mitosis. Yet again, a very simple sort of model. So the question was, were there any components that regulated um, the cyclin-dependent kinase that were um, located in the tips of the cell? Now, I had another project in my lo laboratory for some years, which is concerned with uh, why cells um, grow with particular shapes. And so for that reason, we had identified a number of gene products that are located in the tips of cells. So we had already potential candidates. And one of them, um, which um, w had been originally identified by Jörg Baylor, had been worked on quite extensively in my lab about seven or eight years ago. And this was a gene called POM1, which is 
clearly was located in the tips of the cell, as you can see here. So we wondered whether POM1, um, or any of the other components, but I'm going to tell you about POM1 because it turned out to be correct, whether POM1 had any inhibitory effect on the cell cycle, because that would fit with this model. So the first thing we did was to delete POM1 to see if it advanced cells into mitosis. And much to my surprise, it did. Not dramatically, but wild type divided at 13.7 micrometers in this experiment. POM1 delete divided um, uh, about 25% smaller, 11.7 or 20% smaller. CDR1, when deleted, which is in the same sort of network, um, divided four or five microns longer. So the cells were advanced into mitosis if we got rid of POM1. The reason it was embarrassing is because I'd looked at POM1 mutant cells myself um, seven or eight years ago quite a bit when Jörg was in my lab, and I'd never noticed it. And of course, you, you know, I, I was always looking out for things of that sort, so I was a little ashamed of that. So this gave rise to this model here, that there is a central interface control node which is regulating WE1 and therefore CDK, and that is inhibited by POM1 by fusing in from the, um, from the ends of the cell. Now, does POM1 behave in that sort of way? And the answer is, um, yes, it does. Um, here we see a series of cells of increasing length, and you can see early in the cell cycle, there's quite a lot of POM1 in the middle of the cell, but late in the cycle, it's, it's essentially com uh, more or less completely empty. So it, it could work that way. If we quantitate these sorts of um, cells, what you'll see is early in the cell cycle, there's a lot of POM1, and it rather dramatically drops as cells get longer. So that is consistent with some sort of um, control of the sort that um, I describe. Now, what else can we do to sort of see whether this is a, se a serious model or not? Well, if the position in the cell of the protein is important, then if we could now take POM1 and distribute it around the entire cell, um, we should see an effect on the mitotic control. So, um, um, uh, it, it, so this was done. Jamie did this by fusing POM1 to a plasma membrane targeting um, um, domain and uh, and instead of now seeing POM1 distributed at the ends of the cell, um, now that chim new chimeric protein is distributed throughout the entire cell. If you now look to see what effect that chimera has, bringing POM1 closer to the WE1 control delays the onset of mitosis from 14.3 to cells um, about five and a half, five, six microns longer. So that shows that relocating POM1 from here to the middle of the cell um, delays the onset of mitosis. It doesn't incidentally block mitosis, so it's not the, um, it, it, it isn't um, a complete on-off signal, but it's clear if you relocate it, you delay the onset of mitosis. So this is then our model. Our model is that early in G2, POM1, which is an inhibitory element, um, diffuses probably through the membrane and inhibits the CDR2 network. Um, so CDR2 is off. And as a consequence, WE1 is on, and CDK activity is low. As cells get bigger, the inhibitor is taken away, CDR2 comes on, WE1 comes off, and that allows CDK activity to rise and bring about the onset of mitosis. So a, um, a model for measuring either how big you are, or possibly how long you are, to allow the dividing nucleus far enough to actually separate in the cell and I'm not actually quite sure which it is, because if we delete this system, the cells can still measure how big they are, because they still have cell size homeostasis. I'm not going to show you that data today, because it's too late. Um, but um, uh, there is obviously another cell size sensing mechanism present in the cells, which we are genetically identifying with new, with new mutants. Now, when my postdoc, Jamie, was doing this, and I kept thinking of new experiments for him to do to make it, um, you know, a bit more reliable, and he, get, he you know, as, they, as often is the case, get irritated with their um, supervisor, he kept saying, well, what if somebody else publishes it? And I said, look, I've been working on this for 25 years. Nobody at all has got the slightest chance of publishing, um, of publishing this. And so he goes and gives his first public talk, and he goes to a meeting in Italy, 
and um, he gets up and gives this talk. And then there's somebody called Sophie Martin, who we, we all knew, who had just moved to Lausanne, got up the next talk and gave the identical talk. Would you believe it? She had also identified POM1. She'd also gone through, and this is her data. I'm just going to show it. It's exactly the same. I could not believe it, okay? I could not believe it. Anyway, they were very civilized. They did a sort of deal with each other and um, co-submitted, and nice Philip Campbell sitting there for nature allowed them both to be published back to back. So um, it, it, uh, they both got something out of it. I tell you, though, it gave me um, nearly a heart attack when I heard about it. <laughs> and if it gave me nearly a heart attack, um, my poor postdoc was, uh, you know, he lost about three stone in weight during this process because, um, you know, our reviewers were, you know, a bit tough, as always, you know. Anyway, okay, so that's where we are. There is another cell size sensing mechanism in there. We are identifying it, but we're not there yet there. This is my lab. Um, on our lab outing, okay, and the people who did this work is, uh, is Jamie there and Damien, and, not, uh, and Damien there. This is also Damien. He's my flying instructor. I'm actually a pilot. I fly this thing, um, and my whole lab went out and had aerobatic trips in this. It's a Boeing... 1934 Boeing biplane. Can you believe it? You know, open cockpit like the Red Baron. You know. Anyway, they are the um, they are the, um, the the two others are working on completely different projects. Um, the other students and postdocs. And this is where it was. Rockefeller University, east side of New York. All went on in this building here, the ugliest building on campus. I'm sorry I talked so long. Thank you very very much. Thank you. <laughs>